Senate will come to order. The Chaplain Dr. Barry Black will lead the Senate in prayer. Let us pray. Sovereign God, Lord of the nations, you have magnified your word above your name. As our lawmakers grapple with unyielding problems, give them the wisdom to turn to you for help. Lord, you have promised to supply all of our needs, so give our senators what they need to meet the complex challenges of these days. May they take risk for the sake of truth and justice as they acknowledge with humility their need of your abundant blessings. Bless them with a fresh, regenerating touch of your power. We pray in your strong name. Amen. Please join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will read a communication to the Senate. Washington, D.C., July 6, 2011, to the Senate. Under the provisions of Rule 1, Paragraph 3 of the Standing Rules of the Senate, I hereby appoint the Honorable Kirsten E. Gillibrand, a senator from the state of New York, to perform the duties of the chair, son Daniel K. Inouye, President Pro Tempore. The Majority Leader. The clerk will call the roll. Mr. Cocker.
Madam President, following the leader remarks, the Senate will resume the motion to proceed to S. 1323, which is a bill to express the sense of the Senate on shared sacrifice in resolving the budget deficit. The time until 1230 today will be equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or the designees. The Senate will re recess from 1230 to 215 for our weekly party caucuses. The time from 215 until 6 p.m. is also equally divided and controlled between two leaders or the designees. Yes, I filed a cloture motion on the motion to proceed to S. 1323. This vote will occur tomorrow. S. 1326 is at the desk. That's due for second reading. The clerk will read the title of the bill for the second time. S1326, a bill to implement the President's request to incre increase the statutory limit on the public debt. I, I would object any further proceedings with respect to this matter, Madam President. Objection having been heard, the bill will be placed on the calendar under Rule 14. Mr. President, yesterday my distinguished Republican counterpart said that the debate over how to avert the looming default crisis is really a debate over what kind of a country we're going to be. I agree. That's certainly true. So will we be the kind of country that protects tax breaks and giveaways for the richest people and corporations while sacrificing seniors and the middle class? That is the American my Republican colleagues have proposed. And those priorities are simply backwards. Democrats, on the other hand, believe that in a nation where nearly half the country's wealth is controlled by probably less than 1% of its people, that perhaps 1% should not be exempt from the sacrifices asked of everyone else. If these negotiations will determine what kind of a nation we're going to be. They will also determine the character of the Repu Republican Party as well. Will they be the party that came to Washington to help govern? craft solutions to the difficult issues facing this nation in cooperation with patriots from both sides of the aisle? Or will they be the kind of a single issue, ideological party that walks away from reasonable compromise for the sake of politics? That is the question. David Brooks, a conservative, I repeat, conservative columnist for the New York Times, he was hired for that reason. That usually liberal editorial page, they wanted some, wrote, someone that wrote well and was a certified conservative. David Brooks is who they chose. David Brooks believes that it's obviously turned into an ideological party that walks away from reasonable compromise for the sake of politics. This is what he said yesterday, not me. Conservative columnist David Brooks he said it yesterday about the illogical and ideological Republican Party that has emerged. Here's what he said, and I quote, if the debt ceiling talks fail, independent voters will see the Democrats are willing to compromise, but Republicans were not. If we default, he said, it will be the fault of Republican fanaticism, end of quote. That fanaticism is making compromise impossible no matter how much Democrats are willing to give. Independent Voters Book says, and I quote, will conclude that Republicans are not fit to govern, and they will be right, end of quote. David Brooks, conservative columnist, said this. The Republican Party has, taken over, has been taken over by ideologues either devoted to or terrified by Grover Norquist and his no tax pledge, whatever that means. These Republicans refuse to believe countless respected voices that have said over and over and over how serious a crisis we face if we fail to avoid default. And they've refused a deal that Brooks called, quote, the mother of all no-brainers because it violates an arbitrary pledge. Never mind that the deal is in the best interest of the country and gives Republicans much of what they say they want. They walked away from the table. The statesman Dean Acheson, and he was a diplomat, one of our great diplomats, and certainly a statesman, said that, quote, negotiating assumes parties more anxious to agree than to disagree, end of quote. It's no wonder, then, that Republicans have refused to negotiate. They won't even admit to supporting their own long-held positions if Democrats support those positions, too. 
We should all be able to agree we need to reduce the deficit and get our fiscal house in order. Democrats and Republicans alike have said that. We should all be able to agree we need to avert the global economic disaster an American default would cause. Business leaders and economists alike have said that exact same thing. Just a second here. Pardon me. You know, we should all be able to agree that millionaires and billionaires, oil companies, and the owners of yachts and jets don't need special tax breaks the rest of Americans don't get. Yet Republicans have defended those tax breaks again and again. They claim that Democrats want to raise taxes on shipbuilders and airplane manufacturers. That couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, Democrats want to end special tax breaks for the millionaires and billionaires who are lucky enough to be able to afford private jets and yachts. We're, we're, we, and we're, we're happy that we stand in that way, that way politically. These tax breaks weren't available to middle class Americans. You can't ride off the family station wagon or the rowboat you take fishing with the grandkids, or the little outboard boat you go out with every week to see if you can catch a bass or a trout. These breaks are available for multi-million dollar toys only a handful of Americans can afford. I repeat, I'm proud that Democrats are standing up for America's middle class, middle class families, to the richest of the rich. As my Republican colleagues defend tax breaks for special interest, big donors, and the wealthiest 1% of Americans, I urge them to think once again about what kind of a party, political party, they want to be. They must ask themselves whether they want to be the kind of party David Brooks, a conservative described, a party of unreasonable fanatics that refuse to compromise no matter how sweet the deal for their side might be, and no matter how grave the consequences for our nation if they don't agree. <clears throat> Madam President. Republican leader. Yesterday afternoon, we learned that over the weekend, a Somali terrorist who had been held and interrogated on a U.S. Navy ship for the past two and a half months has been flown to New York to face criminal charges in a civilian court. A Somali terrorist flown to New York to be tried in a civilian court. I strongly disagree with this decision. This Mr. Warsami is a foreign enemy combatant, and he should be treated as one. He should be sitting in a cell in Guantanamo Bay and eventually be tried before a military commission. Warsami is an admitted terrorist. In 2009, Warsami trade, uh, trained and fought with the militant Islamic group al Shabaab in Somalia. Over the last two years, Warsami has provided support and training to al-Qaeda in Yemen. Since the day that President Obama signed the executive order to direct the closure of the military detention facility at Guantanamo Bay and in the Central Intelligence Agency's enhanced interrogation program, Senate Republicans have been asking the administration what would be done with an unlawful, unlawful enemy combatant captured overseas in a place other than Iraq or Afghanistan. At one point, CIA Director Leon Panetta speculated that if Osama bin Laden had been captured alive, he would have been sent to Guantanamo. Over time, it became clear that the administration did not have a policy in place that could address this circumstance. <clears throat> and so without a straight answer, we were left in the dark on how this administration would handle an enemy combatant captured overseas. Finally, after waiting 18 months, I think we have our answer. As was disclosed yesterday, Warsami has been in military custody for months, during which time he has been interrogated by various law enforcement agencies. However, now he has been read his Miranda rights. This is a Somalian terrorist captured overseas has now been read his Miranda rights. Why? Why? Why is a man who is a known terrorist, an enemy of the United States, being afforded the protections of an American citizen? And now he is in the hands of civilian authorities and will be given all the rights accorded to a U.S. citizen in a civilian court. It is truly astonishing that this administration is determined 
determined to give foreign fighters all the rights and privileges of U.S. citizens regardless of where they are captured. In the case of Alwan and Hamadi, two enemy combatants who fought and killed U.S. soldiers in Iraq, they were captured in Bowling Green, Kentucky, my state, and are now awaiting trial in a Bowling Green courtroom, a decision being summarily condemned by Kentuckians and most of their elected leaders from both parties at the state and federal level. And now, Orsami, an enemy combatant with ties to al-Qaeda who was captured overseas and detained by the military for months, is now inside the United States awaiting trial as a civilian criminal suspect. <clears throat> it is not necessary to bring or continue to harbor these terrorists within the United States. The infrastructure is already in place to handle these dangerous individuals at Guantanamo. However, it has become abundantly clear that the administration has no intention of utilizing Guantanamo unless an enemy combatant is already being held there. Instead, <clears throat> The administration has purposely imported a terrorist into the U.S. and is providing him all the rights of a U.S. citizen in court. This ideological rigidity being displayed by the administration is harming the national security of the United States of America. Alwan, Hamadi, Warsami, and all future foreign enemy combatants belong in Guantanamo. They do not deserve the same rights and privileges as American citizens. The administration's actions are inexplicable, create unnecessary risk here at home, and do nothing at all to increase the security of the United States. Now, Madam President, on another subject. Yesterday, I accepted the President's invitation to the White House to discuss what the two parties can do together to reduce our nation's out-of-control deficit and debt, to create jobs, and to put American, the American economy back on a solid footing. As I've said for many months, the upcoming vote on the debt limit should be viewed as an opportunity to do something big that would send a clear message to the American people and the world that we could come together and put our fiscal house in order. Now, it's notable that the President, who not that long ago preferred that we raise the debt ceiling without any corresponding plan to do any of these things, now wants to discuss the need to do something about our crushing debt burden. Thursday's meeting will give us a chance to see if the President means what he says. It's an opportunity to see if the President is finally willing to agree on a serious plan to pay our bills without killing jobs in the process. Until now, the President's proposals have been inadequate and, frankly, indefensible. It's ludicrous for the administration to propose raising hundreds of billions in taxes at a time when 14 million Americans are looking for work and job creators are struggling. Just last December, the President acknowledged that preventing a tax hike meant more resources were available for job creators to add employees. That was the President just last December. In describing why he decided to extend the current tax rates for two more years, because he said it would be bad for job creators. That was just six months ago, and I don't think anybody thinks the economy is in better shape now than it was six months ago. Does the President now think the economy is doing so well that unemployment is so low and economic growth so rapid that we can take billions of dollars away from these very same job creators? That seems to be what he's saying now. It's equally ludicrous to propose more stimulus spending as part of a deficit reduction package. Republicans, and yes, some Democrats, oppose these ideas because they won't solve the debt crisis, and they certainly won't create any jobs. Americans expected that in a negotiation about a debt crisis, that we would actually do something to significantly reduce the debt. And with so many still out of work, we expect the President to not insist on proposals that his own administration says will put even more people on the unemployment line. So we're eager to meet with the President to see if he's really, uh, really willing to do something big for the country. We don't think it's absolutist to oppose more stimulus spending. We don't think it's maximalist to oppose hundreds of billions of dollars of, in tax hikes in the middle 
of a job crisis. We have a better term for it, common sense. So we're ready to meet with the President on Thursday. Maybe he will have changed his mind and returned to his common sense approach just back in December when he said that preventing tax hikes means, quote, freeing up other money to hire new workers, end quote. Hopefully we can finally do something big to reduce the deficit, put people back to work, and prevent Medicare's bankruptcy. That should be our goal. Madam President, I yield the floor. Under the previous order, the leadership time is reserved. Under the pre previous order, the Senate will resume consideration of the motion to proceed to S1323, which the clerk will report. Motion to proceed to the consideration of S1323, a bill to express the sense of the Senate on shared sacrifice in resolving the budget deficit. Under the previous order, the time until 12.30 p.m. will be equally divided and controlled between the two leaders or their designees, with senators permitted to speak therein for up to 10 minutes each. Madam President. Senator from Georgia. Madam President, I rise this morning to talk uh, about the meeting tomorrow the President's called at the White House, a summit I think it's been referred to, one for which I have great hope. I hope it'll be a summit where both sides leave their weapons at the door sit across the table from one another and begin talking about a comprehensive solution to a comprehensive problem. The solution for that problem, though, does not lie in creating villains and enemies. And in the last two weeks, we've heard a lot of rhetoric coming from the White House, demonizing people who have corporate jets or demonizing people who make over a million dollars. I was reminded in this debate about millionaires of the debate in 1969 in America it was one of my first debates that I ever watched. I'd returned home from the service. I'd begun my business. And a report came out in the newspaper that 155 Americans who made over a million dollars paid zero taxes. I personally was astounded. Everybody else was astounded. And Congress went to work to close the loophole, and they did it by creating something known as the alternative minimum tax, something to make sure that someone who paid no tax at least paid their fair share. And I put that in quotes. Today, not 155 millionaires are paying the alternative minimum tax. 34,200,000 Americans are. Because oftentimes when Congress goes to target one person, they catch everybody in a bigger loop. I don't think we need to demonize those who employ Americans, those who create the jobs, those who make our economy run, any more than we should villainize people who want to try and save Social Security or Medicare. The President, in his two speeches last week, targeted millionaires, he targeted job creators, he created villains, and he created enemies. None of that will help us to solve a problem. Now, the President's not the only one playing that game. A little bit of criticism can go to both sides. You know, as we look at the chart that's been on the floor for the last two weeks about what's happened in the last 30 months since the President was elected with critical things, unemployment's up by 1.9 million people, 17 percent in terms of the rate. Gas prices are almost double. Federal debt's up 35 percent. But remember, it was 10 trillion when the president was elected. So it's not just the president's fault, but he is making it worse. Debt per person is now up by $11,258, and health insurance premiums by almost 20 percent. In fact, the only thing that's down in the last 30 months are the expectations of the American people, expectations of what our future is going to be like. So for a moment, I'd like to offer some historical suggestions as to what both sides can do tomorrow at the White House when they leave the weapons at the door, sit at the table, and really begin to negotiate. One is to look back in history when we've had big problems and we came up with big solutions. The 1980s, a particular time, I was in the state legislature then, followed what was happening in Washington. In fact, when I was 39 years old in 1983, Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill had a meeting at the White House. Allegedly, I wasn't there, but allegedly it went something like this. The president said, well, Social Security's going broke in about 20 years. We just got that report. We need to fix it. O'Neill said, I agree. The president said, I'm willing to work on it, but I'm not willing to raise the tax. And O'Neill said, well, I'm willing to work on it, but I don't want to cut the benefit. And they looked at the actuary and said, what do we do? And the actuary said, well, you push the eligibility out, and you get the system back in actuarial soundness. I was 39 in 1983. I would have been collected Social Security at the age of 65 in 2010. But because Reagan and Leo got together, they pushed my eligibility out by one year to age 66, not age 65. And now incrementally it goes up two months a year to say age 67 in a few years. That put the system in actuarial soundness for 60 through 67 years. 
The reason it is now all of a sudden in trouble again is the protracted economy and these difficulties have caused people, baby boomers, to go to the bank now of Social Security and collect early Social Security at age 62. So we've had a rush to Social Security because of the unemployment and the uncertainty in our economy. But Reagan and O'Neill fixed Social Security by pushing the eligibility out. They didn't raise the tax, but they did raise the ceiling upon which it was levied. I think it's interesting politically, a note the President should understand and all of us should recognize, the next year was 1984, and President Reagan won 49 of 50 states a year after he fixed Social Security. So I don't think we ought to demonize people for trying to save the bigger problems of our debt and deficit. Everybody in this room knows that you, couldn't cut, you could cut every discretionary dollar out and you still owe $300 billion in the deficit. We're only going to fix Social Security and Medicare, or the only ways we're going to fix the debt and the deficit. And on Medicare, I was disappointed that when Paul Ryan in the House came up with a forthright plan. He was immediately demonized. In fact, he was invited to the White House and criticized face-to-face -face at a conference the President had. That was just for trying. It's about time all of us started trying. We started to find, try and common ground. We started to look at our solutions in a comprehensive way. It's not time that we stopped calling names and instead we started calling numbers. We started looking at what it is we can do within our control to put our spending back in line amortize our debt over time to a reasonable amount and reduce our deficit over time. It's not going to be fixed with one stroke of a pen or one single piece of legislation. But it is going to begin to be fixed when both sides sit down at the table and understand this is the fourth quarter of the major Super Bowl of the future of the United States of America. And continuing to shoot each other and throw bricks and bats and create victims and create enemies and not talk about the real problems is just making it worse for all of us. It's time we made it better for the American people. I spent the weekend with the American people that live in the state of Georgia celebrating our independence on the 4th of July and spending some time with five of my nine grandchildren. And I remember Saturday night watching my grandchildren play in the den, looking down at them. They weren't looking at me. I was just watching them play, and I thought about their future. I thought about what their future was going to be like in a country that ran on unlimited debt and deficits that inflated its dollar, lowered its expectations, and was not the America that I'd been fortunate enough to live, work, and be born in. And recognizing my age and my time, I know that my future, the years that I have left, are all about those children and those grandchildren. I want to be a part of the solution for the problem today, but a part of their expectations for the future. I don't want them to look back and say, Granddad made it worse. I want them to look back and say, Granddad made it better. Tomorrow is an opportunity for the President of the United States to lead, he has templates that he can lead with. He can either choose to take isolated enemies and isolated arrows and shoot them at people, or he can instead look back at his deficit commission. His deficit commission, which I voted for, by the way. I was one of the Republicans that voted for the creation of the deficit commission. They came back with a comprehensive recommendation in December that should have come to the floor for debate. It dealt with Social Security. It didn't deal with Medicare. It dealt with the tax code. It dealt with spending. It dealt with expenditures. It lowered tax rates and raised opportunity. The president didn't even let it come to the floor of the Congress of the United States. He didn't. He looked the other way. It's time we look straight in each other's eye and say there are solutions out there that good people of goodwill can find a way to do, just like Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill did. But I don't want to be a part of just making it worse. I want to be a part of just making it better. And I hope those at the conference tomorrow sit down with that type of attitude. We don't create enemies and villains. We don't make it worse. But we begin a platform and a template where in the next three to four weeks we can begin to amortize our debt over time, reduce our deficit over time, raise the expectations of the American people, and cause a bright, brighter future for our children and for our grandchildren. And I yield the floor. Senator from Illinois. Madam President, um, I'm going to speak to another issue first, but I want to thank my colleague from Georgia for his comments on the floor. Uh, we're different political parties, but I listen to him, and I know he's sincere. And uh, I think it is that spirit that can lead us to a solution, and I hope that we can find it. I'll address the specifics of it later in my remarks. But first, I'd like to address the comments made by the Republican uh, Senate Minority Leader, Senator McConnell. It relates to a front-page story across the United States this morning where we have apprehended a man whose name is Ahmed Abdul Qadir Warsami a Somali individual who is now being charged with terrorist crimes and going to be tried in the state of New York. 
Uh, this man apparently was apprehended and held for several months on a naval vessel of the United States where he was interrogated about his involvement in terrorism. And then uh, they brought in prosecutors, criminal prosecutors from the United States who interrogated him about what they thought would be actionable crimes uh, that could be prosecuted in the United States. He is now being brought to New York for a trial. The statement made by Senator McConnell this morning on the floor of the United States Senate suggests that this was a bad decision on the part of our President and the Department of Justice to try this man in the criminal courts of the United States. Uh, Senator McConnell has made this speech many times before. He believes that trying terrorists in the courts of the United States makes America less safe and it less likely that we could convict them. He argues they should be held at Guantanamo and tried in military tribunals. His argument has some surface appeal unless you know the facts. And the facts are that under President Bush, after 9-11, and under President Obama, more than 400 suspected terrorists have been tried in the criminal courts of America, Article III constitutional courts, and convicted. They've been tried in our courts and convicted. They are serving time in the prisons of the United States of America. That's right. Convicted terrorists, convicted in criminal courts, now serving time in prisons across America, including in my home state of Illinois at the Marion Federal Penitentiary. So to argue that we cannot successfully convict a terrorist in the United States, as Senator McConnell did this morning, is to ignore reality. The reality is that President Bush used his Department of Justice and our courts to successfully prosecute terrorists. During the same period of time, fewer than five accused terrorists were tried in military tribunals. 400 in Article III criminal courts, fewer than five in military tribunals. Now Senator McConnell makes the argument, and others have joined him, that the only place to try them is in military tribunals. The fact of the matter is, we don't have a very good record in military tribunals trying would-be terrorists. There are a variety of reasons for it. The Supreme Court didn't agree with our procedures. Some of the cases were not very good. The bottom line, though, is to say to any president, whether it's Republican George Bush or Democrat Barack Obama, Congress is going to tell you the best place to try a terrorist. Do we really have that expertise? I don't. I'm not sure Senator McConnell does. I think it's up to the president, the Secretary of Defense, the Central Intelligence Agency, and the Attorney General to make that call. Take the would-be terrorists to the court where we're most likely to convict. Take them to a tribunal where they're going to get a fair hearing in the eyes of the world, and conviction is most likely. That, I think, is what the American people want. To come here and second-guess the president because he's held a man for two months in military interrogation, and now is being prosecuted in our criminal courts, is totally unfair. Unfair because the same standard was not applied to the Republican president, who tried hundreds of would-be terrorists, accused terrorists, in our criminal courts successfully. That's a fact, and that should be on the record. Madam President, I ask that the second section of my remarks be placed in a separate part of the record. Without objection. Madam President, I meant what I said about Senator Isaacson of Georgia. He's a Republican and I'm a Democrat, and he's my friend, and I like him. And we don't agree on everything. Our voting records are much different. But what he had to say this morning was the right thing. And what he had to say this morning, I think, should open the eyes of America about where we need to go. Yesterday, the president sat down and said, we need to be serious about deficit reduction. We don't need a mini deal. We need something that speaks authoritatively to the world that the United States understands its deficit challenge and is prepared to make the hard choices to address it. I think the President's right. I was interviewed this morning by a Quincy, Illinois radio station, and they said, well, why wouldn't you take a mini deal and just get it over with? Well, if you think you'll take a mini deal, you'll probably be offered a mini, mini deal. And at the end of the day, little or nothing will happen. Here's the problem we face, and it's a real problem. For every dollar we spend in Washington, we borrow 40 cents. We borrow it from countries all around the world. The number one creditor of the United States is China. China loans us money so that we can spend for government purposes. How do we spend the money? 
Well, if you look at federal employees, more than half of the federal employees in the United States of America work for one department, the Department of Defense. If you look at expenditures, some of the fastest growing sections of our budget have been on the military side as we wage wars in Iraq and Afghanistan and participate in the NATO exercise in Libya. That's a pretty expensive undertaking. We know that that has gone up 84 percent, military spending in the last 10 years, gone up 84 percent. We know at the same period of time that spending on mandatory programs, that would be like Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, agriculture payments, veterans payments, spending for those payments over the last 10 years has gone up 32 percent. And we know that the rest of the budget so-called domestic discretionary spending, which would include things like building highways, keeping federal prisons open, providing Pell Grants to college students, giving children from poor families uh, early childhood education, putting money at the National Institutes of Health for medical research. That's one section of the budget. It comprises 12 percent of our budget. And in the last 10 years, that part of our budget has gone up zero percent. No increase in spending in that section. Most of our spending goes into the military, 84 percent increase over 10 years, and mandatory programs, 32 percent over 10 years. The biggest driver in terms of federal spending, the thing that we can't seem to get a hold of, health care cost. And you know that as an individual, whether you're trying to buy health insurance for your family, or run a small business and trying to cover the owners and workers or, or look at it from a state and local viewpoint when it comes to public employees. I could analyze the health care system, what I do know about it, but I will tell you that it is a model that is unsustainable. You cannot watch the cost of health care go up beyond inflation every single year and expect to control deficits, whether it's your family deficit your city deficit or your national deficit. But that's the reality of where we are today as we face the current situation. And I listened as the senator from Georgia, whom I respect very much, talked about what President Obama inherited. And I would like to add a little perspective to it. The last time the federal government balanced the budget, ran a surplus, was in the final two years of the Clinton administration, William Jefferson Clinton. Democrat President of the United States. We generated a surplus in those years. That is, we collected more money in taxes and revenue than we paid out, and that hadn't happened for decades. At that point, as William Jefferson Clinton left office as president, the national debt of America, the accumulated net national debt of America from George Washington through William Jefferson Clinton was five trillion dollars, five trillion dollars. And we had a surplus in our annual budget. And when President George W. Bush took over and President Clinton handed him the keys to the White House, he said, next year, if you follow my budget, you'll have a hundred and twenty billion dollar surplus. That's what President George W. Bush inherited. Five trillion dollar national debt a government running a surplus of $120 billion in the next year. Now fast forward eight years later. At the end of President George W. Bush's eight years in office, let's take a snapshot. What did it look like then? The national debt was no longer $5 trillion eight years later. It was almost $11 trillion. It more than doubled in an eight-year period of time. And when President Obama took office, instead of being handed a budget for the next year with a $120 billion surplus, as President Bush was handed by President Clinton, President Obama was, said, was given a budget and he said, next year, if you follow our budget, you will have a $1.2 trillion deficit. Ten times the amount that, he, that President Bush had in surplus, President Obama was told, you'll have that in deficit. You'll owe that much. The books don't balance. What happened in eight years? Well, several things happened. First, we waged two wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, and we didn't pay for them. I think back to, in my history, 
And I can remember as a kid that every birthday I would receive a savings bond, U.S. savings bond. And I used to think it was interesting. They would hand me these $25 U.S. savings bonds, and I knew they cost $18.75. But if I didn't do anything with them and held on to them for almost 10 years, they'd be worth $25. So grandma and grandpa would give me the $25 savings bond, and I'm thinking it's really only $18.75, and I stuck it away. You know. The reason I bring it up is those savings bonds were the way we financed wars. Americans sacrificed and loaned money to their government, and they bought savings bonds. It was my family tradition. It was a tradition of America. But when it came to the two most recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, that didn't happen. We borrowed the money from other countries. And so during that eight-year period of time under President Bush, we waged two wars and borrowed the money and added it to the national debt. And we did something else. No president in the history of the United States of America ever has cut taxes in the midst of a war. And you know why? Because you have your ordinary budget of government, you've got to pay for it. Now you've got a new expenditure with hundreds of thousands of troops in the field and families saying keep them safe and bring them home and you're spending billions of dollars there, how could you cut taxes? That's what happened. During the Bush administration, they cut taxes. Two wars unpaid for, cut taxes, and then the President, Bush, signed into law programs, dramatically expensive programs that weren't paid for. Medicare Prescription Part D was one of them. So you had these programs signed into law War is not paid for, taxes cut, and at the end of an eight-year period of time, the national debt rose from $5 trillion to over $10 trillion, almost $11 trillion. Now, the Republican Party has a philosophy, the Democratic Party has a philosophy. There are those of us who think that sometimes we should listen to one another and try to learn from one another, and I think this is one of those occasions. But I will say to my friends on the Republican side of the aisle in the Senate and the Republican leaders in the House, those who are arguing that the best way to get the American economy moving forward at this point is to give tax cuts to the wealthiest people in America have forgotten their history. That's exactly what we did under President George W. Bush. And look what happened. The biggest deficits in the history of the United States and when Barack Obama raised his hand off of that Lincoln Bible taking the oath of office, that month we lost 700,000 jobs in America. Unemployment was running rampant and just kept going, using the Republican economic theory of tax cuts for the wealthiest people in America. It didn't work then. It won't work now. It's a tired old idea. It may give them points in opinion polls. It doesn't give America points in credibility around the world, and it's a position they're taking. Now, having said that, I guess I could stop here and they say, Durbin, that was a heck of a Democratic speech. Let me go a little bit further. I was on that deficit commission. I sat there for 10 months and I listened to everything. It was split, Democrats, Republicans, President appointed the commission. There were Democratic senators and Republican senators and same thing with House members. And we listened to the whole thing and I came to the conclusion that there were some positions the Republicans had taken that were wrong and there were positions that Democrats had taken that were also wrong. And it was time for us to try to do something smart and to do it bipartisan. And I voted for the Deficit Commission. 11 out of the 18 of us did. And I think I surprised more people than, than I ever imagined. Uh, but I think it was the right thing to do. Madam President, the morning I voted for it, my son, who happens to live in your state now, in Brooklyn, sent me an email and said, thanks, Dad, you're doing the right thing. You know, every dad wants to hear that once in a while in their lives. And I said that at this commission meeting. And it meant a lot to me uh, that my son, uh, whom I greatly love, would have that kind of respect for that decision. So here's what we did, and here's what we need to do now, and here's what we need to say to the American people. We can get out of this mess. America is a good, strong nation. We are good people. We're smart. We're hardworking. We've got a great tradition in this country when it comes to dealing with challenges, whether they're waging wars or fighting recessions, putting a man on the moon. We can do it. We've done it. We'll do it again. Start with that premise. Don't badmouth this country because we're lucky. We're blessed to be living here. And this country and its history has proven over and over again it can tackle the biggest challenges and meet them head on. 
And you know who wins this battle when it comes to the biggest challenges? Average Americans. Who waged our wars? Who were the soldiers that went off to war? They were my brothers in the Korean War. They were others, just regular old families that said, it's our patriotic duty we're going off to serve, and they continue to do it time and again. So when it comes to sacrifice, Americans know that spirit as well. Not only the can-do spirit, but the spirit of, sure, my brothers each gave four years of their lives to the United States Navy, and so many other families did it. And it says that Americans are willing to step up and participate in a national effort when they think we're all together as a nation moving in the right direction, they want to be part of it. I want to be part of it. America wants to be part of it. So when we come down here and talk about solutions to problems, let's talk about everybody rolling up their sleeves and getting involved. Now, I know the poorest the poor can't. They don't have the resources. They may not have the physical and mental ability. Whatever their circumstance, I'm ready to stand and say, we're going to help our most vulnerable people. Uh, asking them to pitch in and sacrifice is Maybe too much in some circumstances, but the rest of us, sure, let's pitch in. And here's what we ought to do. First, we shouldn't say that anyone in America who is wealthy and comfortable in life is going to be spared from sacrifice. Everybody has to give. And those who are better off than some should give more. I don't think that's unfair. Life's been good to them. America's been good to them. And when we need them, they should be asked to help. So the notion of raising taxes on the wealthiest people in America shouldn't be something that we just automatically reject. It should be part of the conversation. Secondly, we have a tax code that you couldn't carry with two arms. It's so big, loaded with laws and regulations, and frankly, most people don't know what's in there. I'll tell you, the people who do know, the special interest lobbyists in Washington know what's in there. The lawyers at the tax firm, they know what's in there and some people in the committees here. And if you go into that tax code, you'll find we spend almost $1.2 trillion in tax expenditures. Most people don't understand that. And I learned a little bit about it at the Deficit Commission. Here's what it comes down to. $1.2 trillion in tax expenditures in the tax code equals all the credits, all the deductions, all the exclusions, everything that you can take to reduce your tax burden. Okay? $1.2 trillion also represents the entire amount of discretionary spending each year in the United States. It's a big sum of money. So we spend it in our expenditure levels, Defense Department, all the way through the Agriculture Department, everything in between, and we forgive or don't collect the same amount in the tax code. So who benefits from that? Well, let's look at the basics. 70% of American taxpayers do not itemize on their tax returns. They file the standard return. They don't itemize. So the tax code doesn't mean anything to them. If there is a special deduction, unless it is a refundable tax credit, rare category, it doesn't help them. 70% of Americans don't touch it. What are the biggest deductions under the U.S. tax code today? I in all my wisdom and education and experience on Capitol Hill, I raised my hand, teacher, and said, well, it's the mortgage interest deduction, right? Wrong. The biggest single deduction is the employer's exclusion for health care premiums. So employers are able to exclude from income the amount of money they spend for health insurance for their employees. That's the biggest. Number two, the mortgage interest deduction. I use it. My wife and I uh, bought our home and thought about it ahead of time. Okay, we get a mortgage interest deduction, maybe we can buy a little more home. A lot of families do. But when you take a look at the mortgage interest deduction and realize 70% of Americans don't itemize, then look at the 30% who do, it turns out the mortgage interest deduction, the lion's share of the money for the mortgage interest deduction goes to the very highest income categories in America. So that comes as a surprise. You think it's a middle class tax cut. It's not. It is by and large a tax cut for wealthy people. I want to preserve that part that, that protects middle-income families. But again, shouldn't those in the highest income categories be willing to see some change in that deduction if it means that America's deficit is finally going to be brought under control? So when you take a look at the tax code, I think we need to be honest about it. There are things in there we can't afford to do any longer, things we maybe never should have done. And we can clean up that tax code. And what we found in the Deficit Commission, by cleaning it up, we can actually 
produce enough revenue out of that effort to lower marginal tax rates. Now, I hope my Republican friends will tune in at this point, because this is something they applaud, and I do too. If we can lower marginal tax rates for families, even businesses in America, it's a good thing. And I'm for it. But it means being honest and tackling the tax code. The other thing we've got to look at are entitlements. Now, this is where it gets dicey on my side of the aisle. People don't want to talk about it. I like Paul Ryan. Congressman Paul Ryan's a smart guy. He's from the Midwest. Maybe I'm partial to him as a result. And he's from Janesville, Wisconsin. And he has studied this issue and knows it well. We come to different conclusions. But he did tackle the entitlements. I think he went too far in Medicare. Doubling the out-of-pocket expenses for people under Medicare is a non-starter. Eliminating Medicare as we know it and putting these folks in the loving arms of health insurance companies in their 60s and 70s is not any kind of favor for the elderly in America. So I disagree with his conclusions. I wouldn't vote for him, voted against him. But I don't disagree with Paul Ryan saying we've got to look honestly at Medicare. Because if we don't touch Medicare in about 10 or 12 years, it goes broke. And we can't let that happen. So we have to look at Medicare in a sensible way to reduce the costs of Medicare. Let me give you one example. In the Medicare Prescription Part D program, prescription drugs for seniors, I think Medicare ought to offer an option. The government ought to have an option people can choose, voluntarily one way or the other, to try to buy pharmaceutical drugs in bulk, reduce their cost so that seniors pay less. Is that a radical concept? It's exactly what we do in the Veterans Administration. We can do it for seniors under Medicare Prescription Part D, reducing the cost of that program and the cost to seniors, and creating as part of the uh, spectrum of competition a Medicare prescription program, one that people can opt in if they want to. So there are ways to save money in Medicare without endangering basic benefits. Here's the last thing I'll say. I see my colleague from Louisiana is here to take the floor, and I don't want to keep him waiting. But I will say this. Tomorrow, I'll be honored to be invited to the White House with Senator Reid to meet with the President and the leadership in the House and Senate, Democrats and Republicans. The President has said, leave your ultimatums at the door. Pretty good advice. And I think the President understands, if we do not extend the debt ceiling of the United States on August 2nd, it will have a dramatic negative impact on the American economy. It's as if you would default on your mortgage. Same, same result. Our creditors around the world will say, oh, America's not going to pay its bills on time? Hmm, maybe we won't loan them money. Maybe if we loan them money, we'll raise the interest rate. And if they raise the interest rate on our government, they'll raise the interest rates across our economy, whether you're borrowing for a home or a car or whatever it happens to be. So it would be the height of irresponsibility for us to default on America's debt. That debt ceiling needs to be extended so that interest rates don't go up, because if they do, it will hurt our economic recovery and put more Americans out of work. The template for our meeting tomorrow should be the President's Deficit Commission. I'll only take exception to one thing Senator Isaacson said earlier. He said that the President did not let it come to the floor for a vote. His Deficit Commission? In fairness to Senator Isaacson, that wasn't the President's responsibility. That's our responsibility to bring it to the floor for a vote. I've been trying for months, six months now, with a handful of other colleagues, Democrats and Republicans, to bring this to the floor so that we would have a vote on it. We haven't quite reached that point. I'll keep on trying, but we should. And I think it still remains the best way to approach the deficit challenge. Put everything, underline everything on the table. Look to that deficit commission. The Simpson-Bowles Commission gave us guidance as to how we can get out of this. And if we do, if we get it done, and we can, we can do this, I think it's going to inspire people around the world to believe again in America's future as an economy, to invest in America, to create jobs. It's going to be like the turnaround that occurred when Bill Clinton came to office and said, I'm taking the deficit seriously. He passed his deficit reduction plan by one vote in the House. I was there. By one vote in the Senate when Pre Vice President Al Gore cast the deciding vote. And look what happened to our economy. Dramatic increase in job creation, dramatic increase in business ownership, dramatic increase in business creation, home ownership. That, to me, can happen again 
if we come up with a bipartisan, sensible, inclusive budget deficit plan of the magnitude the President called for yesterday. Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. Senator from Louisiana. Madam President, I'd ask if the Chair inform me when I've consumed 12 minutes. I will. Thank you, Madam President. Madam President, first I rise to, to celebrate that we are finally, finally, after months and months of doing everything under the sun but facing our gravest challenge, spending and debt, we're finally focused on that on the floor of the United States Senate. Uh, and that's progress. We have a long way to go, but at least that's progress. For months, I've been urging us as a body, urging the distinguished majority leader who controls the floor, please let's focus on our gravest challenge, federal spending and debt, right here on the floor of the Senate. Not wait to the 11th hour. Not wait to a crisis atmosphere around the debt limit. Let's have a constructive debate, put meaningful legislation on the floor about spending and debt. And for months and months and months, unfortunately, we did everything but that on the floor of the U.S. Senate. The majority leader looked for every bill, every topic but that, and it was uh, all sorts of cats and dogs, many of them, quite frankly, trivial, unnecessary legislation, particularly compared to this grave challenge of spending and debt. Finally, last week, a group of us conservatives said, enough is enough. We said we shouldn't go out on our planned July 4th recess, July 4th break, which was scheduled to be all of this week. And we said, we're going to block that. It takes unanimous consent for that to happen. We're going to block it. And sure enough, we did. And then we said, wait a minute. We're not blocking that to be here just to be here. We're not blocking that to be here and continue to move on to every other issue under the sun but spending and debt. We did that to finally focus on the floor of the United States Senate on this gravest of all of our current challenges, federal spending and debt. And so we said we're going to vote against the motion to proceed to the Libya debate. Now, Libya is an important matter, and in fact that debate is long overdue in Congress. Those votes are long overdue, but that challenge does not rise to the level of our greatest fundamental challenge right now as a nation, spending and debt. And so we said we're going to block that motion to proceed to yet another unrelated matter. And we did. We rounded up the votes for the last half week, and we got those necessary votes to block that motion to proceed. And as a result, the distinguished majority leader pulled that vote, vitiated that cloture vote yesterday. And so finally, finally, we have an instrument on the Senate floor, a motion on the Senate floor about this central challenge we face, spending and debt. So that is progress. I urge all of my colleagues to come down and join this most important debate, and I continue to urge the majority leader to put meaningful, substantive legislation on the floor about this topic. We have motions on sense of the Senate resolutions. It focuses us on the proper topic, spending and debt. That is progress. But of course, a sense of the Senate resolution does not do anything, does not change anything. So we still have further to go in terms of bringing, bringing meaningful legislation to the floor on this, our gravest challenge, federal spending and debt. Now, why do I insist that this is our top challenge at hand. Well, the facts speak for themselves. Of every dollar the federal government spends, of every dollar over 40 cents is borrowed money, over 40 cents of every dollar. Imagine if you ran your household that way. Wouldn't take long for you to hit a financial dead end and virtual bankruptcy if out of every dollar your family was spending 40 cents was borrowed money. What does that mean? It means we're collecting as a nation, as a federal government, about 
trillion dollars a year. That is a lot of money, 2.2 trillion dollars. Problem is we're spending 3.7 trillion dollars, way, way, way more than we're collecting. The distinguished majority whip mentioned entitlement spending, and I agree with him that is a big part of the issue which we must face in a careful, substantive way. Because Medicare is one of those big entitlement programs, it too is on an unsustainable path. The average American pays about $110,000 into Medicare over his or her lifetime, a lot of money, but on average, that average American receives in benefits over $300,000 under Medicare. There again, it's not tough to do the math. That is unsustainable. When the average American pays in $110,000 and receives in benefits over $300,000. Social Security, another huge entitlement program. This year, it's taking in less than it's spending on current retirees. That day of reckoning was going to be several years down the road. It's been accelerated. It's here and it's here now, right now. Social Security is taking in in tax revenue less than it's giving in, uh, paying out in benefits to retirees. And so what does this mean? This adds up and up and up and up. And so we have more new debt under this administration, more new debt under President Obama than the debt compiled under all of the previous presidents combined from George Bush to the next George, George W, or the latest George, George W. Bush. More new debt under this president than debt accumulated from all of those previous presidents combined. We must do something. And we must do something about the real problem spending and debt. Washington, in a bipartisan way, has a spending problem. The fundamental problem isn't that we're undertaxed. We all know that, no matter what station in life we come, in, come from. The fundamental problem is that Washington doesn't live within its means like we need to as families sitting around our kitchen tables. And so, Washington has a fundamental spending and debt problem, and we need real solutions, rigorous, disciplined solutions to get that under control. How do we go about that? Well, to me, it really comes down to three important things. Cut, cap, and balance. Cut, cap, and balance. Cut. We need to cut the budget now. We need to cut the budget this year and next year. We need immediate, meaningful cuts. And that's why I support those immediate, meaningful cuts in the federal budget. We can't put off meaningful cuts for one year or five years or 10 years. We need them right now. Now, a few weeks ago, we had some budget proposals on the floor. We had several Republican proposals, and we had President Obama's proposed budget. The Obama budget didn't cut in a meaningful way. It doubled the debt in five years and tripled the debt in 10. On the Republican side, we had three different alternatives, all of which cut the budget in a meaningful way, and I voted for all three. So we need to start now, today, with cuts. But that's not enough. That's short term. We need immediate cuts. We need medium term caps. And we need balance. And so caps, what do I mean by cap? I mean we need established spending caps in each major category of the budget that takes some sort of extraordinary supermajority in the Congress to supersede. So we need a glide path to actually get through those caps to a balanced budget in a reasonable period of time. There are several proposals in this body. There are several proposals in the House, mostly from the Republican conservative side, virtually all of them, to establish those caps, 
to get us on that disciplined, mandatory path so we reach that balanced budget. And third and finally, balance. The goal needs to be a balanced budget. And it can't be a goal generations off. It can't be a goal decades off. It needs to be a goal within our site. And the only way, ultimately, I believe we can absolutely ensure that is through a balanced budget constitutional amendment. And I'm very proud to be a co-author, along with all of my Republican colleagues, every single one of us, co-author of a strong, meaningful, substantive, balanced budget constitutional amendment. Now, this has been debated in this body in the House for some time. Uh, last time it was voted on on the floor of the U.S. Senate, it came within one vote of passing. We need to have this ultimate protection and straitjacket and enforced discipline to say we're getting to a balanced budget, we're going to stay there, we're not going to get in this state again. Virtually every state in the country has such a balanced budget constitutional amendment under their state constitution. And that enforced discipline works. That straitjacket at the state level works. It works in my state of Louisiana. We have such a provision in our state constitution. It says you can't have a state budget that's out of balance. And guess what? That mandate, that straitjacket works. And every year, the legislature, working with the governor, produce a balanced budget. And if they go out of session and a month later, revenues fall, uh, and the budget goes out of balance, guess what? They have to come back in within a set period of time and they have to rebalance that budget. It's not fun. It's not easy. It's been particularly difficult in this horrible economy for the last several years. But because of that mandate, because of that constitutional provision, it gets done. And that's what we need at the federal level. We need a balanced budget constitutional amendment. Cut, cap, and balance. It's an important formula, simple but substantive, to get us to where